Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Brady. I'm here with Kaz Najatian, who is the Chief Operating Officer of Shopify. Kaz, good to see you. I know you're from a family of entrepreneurs. I see your mother is a Shopify merchant. Is that right? Yes, yes, she is. Well done. When one recruits family, you know you're good at your job. But um, I want to talk. So let me start with COO, which is a title that a lot of companies have done away with because it's germane yeah. to the conversation. What is your mission at Shopify? So look, our job at Shopify is to make it so that everyone can become an entrepreneur and can start grow and run their business, right? From hello to IPO. It's yeah. our job to make that journey easier because most of the world is set such a big business benefits and small business businesses get scrapped. And this makes it very hard to build new businesses and new businesses are the lifeblood of the economy. So it's our job. That's your customers, the right? Yeah. That, the, so those are your customers. Your job is really an internal, you know, like keeping oh gosh, everything yeah. running on time. Well, how do you see in terms of facilitating a work structure that allows you to do that better? I see. So look, I, I grew up as a product person. I built products. So becoming a COO was an odd uh, job choice for me. Um, but I decided to take it on and decide that I would treat the building of a company like it was building a product. That what mm -hmm. is the thing you want the product to do so you should optimize for those things. And it turns out that most modern companies were built essentially after World War II and not much has changed since then. And mm -hmm. they're all run like an army in World War II. And that's really bad for the modern world. Modern companies optimize for managers rather than crafters. They put the so, manager's time ahead of crafters. That, that just breaks everything. So give me give me a sense of the analogy. If not, if not run like the military, what would you say is the analogy? Because we're talking, you know, you've obviously you've, you've been particularly draconian, if that's the right term, and eliminating meetings from the schedules, almost famously so at this point. Um, Give, what is your analogy as to what the ideal company looks like, if sports not post-World War II? Sports teams. Team. Sports teams are much, are much better analogies. If you think of a sports team, sports teams aren't optimized for the coach or the general managers. They don't spend all their time figuring out, ooh, is the coach in good shape? That's actually not how it works. Competitive companies need to optimize for crafters, the people who do the actual work make sure they get the time and the resources they need to do their life's work. And because that's where value comes from, for customers, for shareholders, for everyone. And I think that's something that we're trying to do at Shopify. Think what is the environment that creates the best production value for, for our crafters? Well, let's talk about crafters, but I, I, before we get to that, I do feel like what makes or breaks a winning team is often the coach. So let's, we are, what is the role of the coach in your company? Look, I, th I think Toby, who's our CEO and I, um, think that it is our job to provide the overall aim for the company. This is a broad direction we're gonna go You're in. You're the this coaches. Kind of yeah, that, that's what we do. And, but even in that world, to be honest, um, Shopify is unique in that even managers at Shopify build things. So I write code, Toby writes code, we do actual work. It's not, um, I was joking around with a friend that Toby, our CEO, pushes code to production almost every single day. I can't think of a single oil company executive that has a shovel in their hand every single day. That's not how it works, right? We are, we are a company of builders, so we all build. And we, because of that, we actually can actually do it, do it differently. Well, I want to get into that a bit more, but let's start with what you've gotten a lot of attention for, which is this death to meetings uh edict yeah. it really january is when it started where you took i think you basically eviscerated meetings that were on people's calendars of more than three people um yeah. i understand meetings are a time suck like the word you know sometimes just brings the mood down for people but what are the best types of meetings to keep because you must be having meetings yeah i mean look what we did was we got rid of all recurring meetings in January that had more than two people. Just got rid of all of them. This reduced 14,000 meeting series. It's the equivalent of adding like an extra 26% to the company in terms of the number of people that just 
you'd have to hire. Um, and look, I think this is there's an interesting thing because most meetings don't actually end up being about um, getting something done. They end up being about coordination or alignment or dissemination. And all yeah. these things can just be asynchronously. Just write someone a note, send them an email. Like that's much easier so people can not have their day perpetually interrupted. Do you need to have meetings to get some work done? Sure. But I bet you the average company needs 90% fewer meetings that they're having. What is the, how do you spend your day? Let's let's make this personal because, yeah. you know, you've done away with meetings. What's the best use of your time? Walk us through a little bit when you do have meetings yeah. and what kind they are. Yeah, so even I don't have as many meetings as the average executive. Like I think like on Wednesdays, I have zero meetings. I think that's very yeah. rare for company executives. So I spend my time trying to unblock teams and I try to do it asynchronously. I read memos they've written, product briefs. I work, I look at the code they've written. I look at things that are about to go into production. But one of the things we've done at Shopify is we've built our own internal operating system for ourselves. We have a tool called GST. It mm -hmm. stands for Get Shit. And Get Shit, it's okay. Built, it's a software we've built ourselves that allows us to work asynchronously. So teams can propose projects, they can work on building projects together, and it, it provides a perfect view into the company of how many people are working on what, how it's going, and it's a very lightweight thing. So I spend a lot of my time almost like a gamer playing a game, but the name of the game I play is the Shopify game where I can actually have a dashboard of real-time activity. Have you have you tweaked this at all? Because let me tell you my, um, you know, I've noticed like Mark Zuckerberg, you know, talked about managers managing managers, you know, that at Facebook, and I know you've worked at uh, Meta now, but you worked at Facebook. I know Elon Musk talked about the ratio of managers to programmers. There seems to be this, this distaste for managers. And my bias, in all honesty, is I I grew up with a, a dad who was a salesman, but really he spent a lot of time, you know, talking Mel off a ledge, you know, doing, you know, talking strategy with Stan, yeah. encouraging Helene. Like, what is the what is the ideal manager? And and you talk about managers versus crafters yeah. in the company. How many managers do you optimally want to have, and what's their ideal role? I mean, I think ideally you have fewer managers her crafter all the time. I actually don't think there is a, if you could create a system where individual people working without any managers could achieve an optimal, you'd do that. But the ideal- No managers is, at all? Yeah. I mean, I think this is like, this is my, the point I made to the company internally in January, which is the most beautiful piece of music ever created was a Beethoven's Ninth. There's one conductor, everyone else is playing a piece of music. Everyone else is making sound, and there's one conductor whose job it is to coordinate. And that's clearly ideal. Like just one Most of us are not world-class musicians, though. We need a little sure. boost, we need structure, we need totally. encouragement, we need direction and guidance. Totally. So we can't, we can't create the ideal state. We can't get to perfect, but we can get better every year. And yeah. that means creating the uh, structures where you can become a better musician every year. You can okay. get better at your job every year. So the job of managers should be evaluated on how much better the people they manage are getting at their job every single year and how much better they are at producing the thing they're meant to produce. Yep. Those are only the things that ma managers can do. So to do that, it turns out you don't really actually need to have that many managers. Like I think How many do you have at Shopify? Maybe because uh, I think that one it, it's innovative. What you've done with the manager versus crafter is really saying there's equally valid career paths. You don't have to manage people to get ahead. So what percentage of your employees now are would you put in the manager category and what should it be? So I, th I think we try to average, we try to get teams to at least each manager having eight people under them. So that's the minimum bar. We try to get everyone there. But we yep. have teams but there are managers that manage 20, 25 people. Um, so the, the range is large. And we're always yep. starting to have that range go higher and higher. Uh, but the thing that happens, honestly, is most people don't want to be managers. Most people become managers because it's the way to get promoted. It's a way to go further in your career track. 
And that's just really bad because you take someone who's good at something and make them do something they're not good at and don't want to become good at. Like most of our engineers just want to write code. Most of our designers just want to design product. Most of our salespeople just want to sell. And if you allow them to make more money, become further in their career path without having to manage people, they will all say yes. Turns out managing people turns out isn't like the only thing that's important in a company. But and yet a great manager, I'm sound, I'm sounding here in defense of manager. You're in a managing role mm -hmm. in essence, are you not? Would you just yeah. describe your, do you want to be a manager? Yeah, so I look, I have gone back and forth in my career. Um, where I've been a manager, then I've been a crafter, a manager. So I, I, I can do both. I prefer still doing crafty work. I prefer building product with my own hands. Mm -hmm. But right now, it just so happens that Shopify, I can have the most impact by building the company that is Shopify. So uh, I, I don't think, I, but I don't think I am the average person. Like, I think no. The average Drive. You started a company. You've, uh, you've, you know, you're COO of a hot, you know, e-commerce giant. Uh, you know what's interesting is you did a law degree. Mm -hmm. Why? Did you want to be a lawyer? No, I desperately didn't. I didn't even want to go to college. I wanted to start companies when I uh, left high school. But I'm an immigrant, and mm -hmm. my mom was determined that I shall become educated. Your mom, so the entrepreneur. Yeah, so, so my mom was an entrepreneur and decided that life was too hard and I should go and get an education and get a proper job. But then I ended up spending basically all my time in college and law school building businesses and trying to create side hustles. So, um, With Shopify, this is a stock that's been extremely hot. You know, things get volatile. You're in a company, one of the things is people must constantly be watching how the stock is doing. There's a lot of distractions. What's your message? How do you manage that? Because everybody left to their own devices yeah. is not always the most efficient system for getting things done. So Shopify has a culture where our employees actually don't really look at the stock price every day. Uh, in fact, when we had offices- How do you no know? <laughs> well, when we had offices, we no longer have offices, but when we had offices, if you were caught looking at the stock price during the day, you had to buy the entire floor donuts. Ah, so no one, that's so an expensive have, proposition. Yeah, we have a culture where we don't really spend that much of our time caring about the stock price transparently. I don't like. I honestly don't know what the stock price is today. I just honestly don't know. Well, um, uh, how important are financial incentives? Because you actually have penalties for meetings too. Do you still have those? Yeah, yeah. What we what we do is we show you the cost of every meeting. So when you book a meeting, you immediately get told in Google Calendar how much that meeting will cost. And we also tell everyone who got that meeting how much that meeting will cost, and we urge those people to cancel the meeting. So we actually we're very and and we're very and then if you try to book a meeting on Wednesdays, we send you a message saying, "Hey, we trust you to make good decisions, but you probably shouldn't have meetings on Wednesdays." So we're very um, like we've gone relatively far down this road of trying to make sure that people crafters don't have to get invited to meetings uh, because. It's hard if you, in a regular company, if your boss invites you to a meeting, you, you can't really say no. With right. like Shopify, you can. In fact, the default answer to meetings at Shopify is no. People say no to meetings to me, with me all the time, which is great. So no penalties have been doled out. Give me a sense no. of the financial savings, because you, what is the cost that you put on a meeting, how much, if I book a meeting with three people on a Wednesday, how much are you telling me that will cost? And anywhere from $700 to $1,600, depending on who's in the meetings. And that's just for a meeting with three people. And you can imagine, just imagine the number of meetings you've been to where it's 25 people in a boardroom table and half of them are playing phone, the games on their phone. Like that's just like basically the average meeting in the more modern world. What is a gold standard meeting? What are the meetings that knock it out of the park? Because you're, yeah. we're giving the impression that there are no meetings at no, Shopify, meetings. and that's not true. No, of course there are meetings. The, the goal of meetings is to unblock things that can only be unblocked with meetings. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. right, that's the only goal. Um, so if you have a project that has slowed down and it has become hard to communicate asynchronously, book a meeting. Just book one, it'll get done. Um, but the first thing you should try is to unblock it asynchronously. See if you can 
like send an email, write a note. The wonderful thing about writing notes, and all of our notes are public at Shopify, is that not only does it solve it, it also may solve someone else's problem because notes are public. They can see how something got solved. So the point, the point of meetings is to make us go faster. If booking a meeting will unblock you faster now and in the future, book a meeting, but have only the people you need. Don't have anyone in the meeting whose job it is to just listen. One of the things that's really tough in this environment, I mean, I know you're, I describe, I assume you're sort of more hybrid. Maybe you can tell yourself, are, are you fully remote? Is that the best way to describe yeah, Shopify's? We call it digital by design. So the company oh, so, is, no, no one has to come to an office ever. And so when you're starting your career, and I've had, I've experienced this, right? You're looking at people and it's hard to start a career in your bedroom. Um, you know, it's hard to naturally get mentors to get that cultural fabric that comes with being in an office and having to buy everybody donuts. How do you, how do you create the culture in that environment where it, it's a, an individualized experience? Yeah, I mean, look, I think you have to be much more deliberate about it. When you are in person, culture kind of just happens. Mm -hmm. When you're a full remote company, you have to be very deliberate about culture. But there are lots of things that are fully remote that have very good culture. Let me give you two examples. If I grew up playing video games online. Video games community have very real culture. Multiplayer uh, games? Yeah, yeah. And, so, and I'm a Reddit user. Subreddits have very good culture to themselves. It's just required for you to be deliberate about it. So we're deliberate. We write down our cultural values. We tell you what you need to do. We're very deliberate about things that we say that we reward. Um, and then one of the things we also do is we do this thing called bursting, which says- Bursting. Yeah, teams every once in a while can get together to solve a problem together. So the average person at Shopify flies a couple of times a year to see their colleagues in person to break bread, have a drink, and solve a problem. So we're not completely remote. We have some in-person aspects of our lives, but we're mostly a remote company, um, which has been interesting. Uh, so talk a little bit about when you imagine, if we're talking about Shopify five years from now, one of the things in terms of how you scale and, and you, know, you know, replicate scale, is this a model that you think replicates well at scale because as companies bureaucracy tends to be a symptom of growth and it could be yeah. structure or it can be red tape depending on how well you do it what is the right structure for growth or do you think that this is you can just keep doing like an army of crafters that can scale 10x from yeah. here i mean look i think there's a couple of things that is real about shopify one of them is one of our values is just trying to be different like we actually honestly try to be different so if every company does something one way we just try something else and one of the things we have tried is um writing software where other people have human beings so we don't have that many project managers at shopify or that many program managers we just write software to replace that job so human beings can only do what human beings Deploying do. AI, I've seen a lot of talk yeah. about that. Yeah, I use AI at work every single day. I just wrote our board letter um, and most of it was written by AI. Okay. So I'm like, relatively far That deep personal it, touch, now. Kaz. No, I'm just kidding. Well, I, I, you, I edited you reviewed it. it so. I think, I think we can grow much bigger. I think Shopify can have millions of more merchants and be a much bigger company and still not need that many managers. So before we round up, I want to ask that you are in Canada, and mm -hmm. I remember many years ago speaking to Jim Balsilli about some of the challenges. In, in that case, it was research in motion, Waterloo, of not having that the same kind of ecosystem that you have in Silicon Valley. Do you think, is that still the case? Do you feel like there's particular advantages that some of these hubs have that you mm -hmm. have to make up for or do you think that's antiquated thinking i don't think so i think shopify grew up outside silicon valley and because of that it is different and better mm -hmm. we didn't have cargo call in the same way every silicon valley company kind of ended up doing so no i, th I think you can start a business anywhere in the world these days and uh be, be incredibly successful and if you look at our merchants some of whom are like have sold billions of dollars worth of stuff yeah uh, they're from all over the world um, and I think the, 
the world is becoming much, much more friendly to entrepreneurship. So let me ask advice besides, I mean, you're a COO. What advice do you have to other, let's just say leaders, aspiring leaders, knowing what you know now um, as to how to build a great company and run a great company? You're the running part. Um, Besides meetings, what other tips would you give as we finish up? So I think people should ask questions of why things happen. Like if you look at a system, figure out what the incentives in that system are. And if those are incentives you don't like, don't create those. Unfortunately, lots of leaders of companies accidentally create companies where the main product is a career ladder. Mm -hmm. And that's not what any company should do. So if you find out you're spending a lot of your time on organizational structure or on promotion calendars or like just the type of things that are not the main value prop of your company, stop. There's no law that says every company needs to look the same. That law doesn't exist. So my advice to folks is, you know, break the mold. One last question. Anything on your radar as to what's around the corner with Shopify that you'd put on ours? I know there's a yeah. limit, perhaps, you know, public company, no, I but think, I, I think the company look, I think people, what, Shopify is still massively underestimated and underappreciated in terms of how broad the product area is. Uh, we just had Shopify editions, which we do twice a year to release new products. And with a hundred over a hundred new features and products that we, re- we had in this edition, mm-hmm. anywhere from uh, Sidekick, which is uh, our AI product giving every uh, entrepreneur a uh, sidekick, to Shopify's all new point of sale, which is a, among the fastest growing retail operating systems for physical retailers, to uh, Shopify audiences, which is our marketing and advertising products. So I think the breadth of the product is underappreciated, and I think people should expect the product to get broader oh. and broader. All created with very few meetings. Um, So thanks for joining us, Kaz. Thanks for having me.